I honestly feel like I could say, yeah, what Tim said, and just pray and get out of here. It's really true. I love just in a very simple way, like what it comes down to is like, it's just following Jesus, believing in him. Like that's the foundation. That's the starting point, isn't it? Uh, I've been actually reading lately. Uh, I have been reading lately. I'm kind of proud of that. Uh, technically, I've been listening to other people read. That's how I read my books, audio books. Can I get an amen? Um, uh, but I, I've been parking on books about manhood lately. Uh, I think that especially once I did get married and started having kids, I had this real desire uh, to want to do it right. And I, and I did not do it right all the time. Uh, did some good things, but made a lot of mistakes too. And, uh, you know, now my kids are adult age. I can look back. I, I actually think, wow, my kids are so gracious. They, they still want to hang out with me. Uh, they don't avoid me 100% of the time. Uh, so I must have done a few things okay. But I'm, I crave knowing more about what it means to really be the, the man that God wants me to be. And of course, right now, a lot, of, a lot of things that you can read about are things like how perhaps the culture ha- has really muddied the waters, if you will, of defining what even manhood is, what masculinity is. I read one book about that and how it really talked about how traditional masculinity, you could argue, is, is really just been completely pushed away. And yet, another argument to that is, it maybe some of it needed to, to be honest with you. If we look back on what we would even call traditional masculinity, was that working for us? Was, was that what God wanted even? Uh, and so I love uh, how I do think that the positive thing going on in our world and our culture right now is this idea that, you know, the, all the stereotypes uh, that we play into what it means to be a man, that, that maybe those are overemphasized, and that there are some other bigger things that should be emphasized when it comes to what it means to be a man. And I, I agree with that. Uh, one of my favorite books I've read recently is from Brant Hansen, who is the 93.3 DJ. You may have heard of him. Great guy. I love listening to him talk. He wrote a book called The Men We Need. It just was released recently. It's a great, great book. Uh, But this comes from a guy, and and it's got great biblical truths on manhood. It's one of my favorite books I've read about that. Uh, But he himself calls himself an avid indoorsman who plays the flute. You know, so he he totally goes away from the stereotypes, if you will, what you think about manhood. Uh, So whether you're an avid indoorsman or an avid outdoorsman, whether you play the flute or you play the TV remote, like I do better than the flute, uh, or whatever it is, whatever you would define what you're like as a man, I would argue that it, it starts in the Bible. And I know... That sounds so trite, oversaid, but I don't think it can be oversaid. We said this, you know, well, it was great to hear Missy uh, share and Lori share about just getting connected and the Grove Women's Facebook page has just really been a good place to meet. And now, now we guys, we, we tend to not like to do it that way, but we have been huddling a little bit on Grove Men Facebook page too. And last week, we, we agreed to this statement, to become a man of God, you must become a man of God's word. And you're like, okay, yeah, of course you're going to say that, Bill. Listen, it is true. It is real. I'm telling you right now, if you're like thinking, I just want to figure out how to become the person God wants me to become. Man, get in his word. See what he says about it. Look to his wisdom and his guidance. It's right there. And we spend so much time taking in other information from all kinds of sources. But what about God himself? He's like, man, I got it. I got you. I got you covered. Just, just read what I wrote you, <laughs> and I'll give you some instruction. We're going to look at a really cool passage. Uh, and I don't think I've ever preached from this story before, uh, but it's an epic story found in the Old Testament. And if I give this message a name, you probably saw it on the screen earlier, I would give it a me- the, the title, the t- A Tale of Two Men. And we're going to look at a story about two different men who I would argue actually had two very similar reactions. And I would call them very stereotypical man reactions, if I'm being honest. But then 
something happened after those reactions, and the two men had two very different outcomes. And I think it teaches us something about how to become the person that God wants us to become. A key, if you will, to manhood if you, it, from the Bible standpoint. So one of the two men in this story is a man you may be familiar with in Scripture. His, man, his name is David. You know, he's probably most well known for being the one who slayed Goliath with just a stone and a sling. Uh, he was anointed to become the king of Israel where we take up our account today. He's not the king yet. He's been anointed, but he's not the king yet. In fact, he's running from the king. Saul, his predecessor, one who seemed to have a decent relationship with him. At one time, David would play the liar and calm Saul down because Saul was kind of tormented by uh, almost these terrible thoughts that would stress him out. and Saul would be very caring and positive towards David in one chapter. Next thing you know, he's slinging a spear wanting to kill David. I mean, this is Saul. He was very, I don't know, all over the place, if you will. So David has been living this nomadic lifestyle with about four uh, probably about 600 other men, warriors, and they would just go from place to place to place. There were stories about them literally spending the night in caves. And, and actually, David, being the kind of man that he was, he's a great example of manhood in that he could have taken Saul's life. It, it, it could have ended his nomadic lifestyle running from this king. He, he One time, Saul, the king, literally went into a cave where David was hiding to use the restroom. And David could have take, taken care of all of his problems right there. And instead, he cuts off a piece of his robe and, and shows Saul later on, like, I could have I could have killed you. I could have ended this crazy cat and mouse chase we've been on, and I didn't. And Saul's response was awesome. It was humble. It was like, oh, man, you're a great man. And yet, Saul didn't change the trajectory of his life or path. He still remained jealous and, and murderous in his pursuit of David. So that's David's life. That's what he's been living like when we get to 1 Samuel 25. And we're introduced to a completely other man who had a similar man response to David. And I want to spoil it for you. Just, just jump in and read this together. 1 Samuel 25, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Samuel died. Now Samuel is like the spiritual leader of Israel. He's a prophet, a priest. Now Samuel died, and all Israel gathered for his funeral. It was kind of a big deal. They buried him at his house in Ramah. Then David moved down to the wilderness of Maon. Took, again, took his men. We're going to a new location. There was a wealthy man from Maon who owned property near the town of Carmel. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it was sheep shearing time. This man's name was Nabal, and his wife Abigail was a sensible and beautiful woman. But Nabal, a descendant of Caleb, was crude and mean in all his dealings. When David heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep, he sent ten of his young men to Carmel with this message for Nabal. Peace and prosperity to you, your family, and everything you own. I am told that it is sheep shearing time. While your shepherds stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them and nothing was ever stolen from them. Ask your own men and they will tell you this is true. So would you be kind to us, since we have come at a time of celebration? Please share any provisions you might have on hand with us and with your friend David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal in David's name, and they waited for a reply. Who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread my water, and my meat that I've slaughtered for my shearers <laughs> and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where. So this is one stereotypical man response, right? Nabal, like, this is my stuff. Like, I don't owe you anything. So tell him to move it along, <laughs> if you will. And then verse 12, so David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said, get your swords, was David's reply, <laughs> okay? <laughs> As he strapped on his own sword, by the way, 
Then 400 men started off with David, and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. So here's another, dare I say, stereotypical, I say man response, a human response. This is what we do. Oh, you're going, you're going to disrespect me like that? You're going to be like that to me? Now, I, don't, I would not say we automatically start strapping on weapons when that happens. You know, our weapons are a little bit different today. You're like, oh, I'm going to post about this right now. You know, I'll show them. Oh, I'm going to tag them in this. No, this is, a, this is a human response. I would argue in this moment we have two men responding in the wrong way. <laughs> Ways that God would not want them to respond, right? All right, so here we go. Verse 14, meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us, and we never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. You need to know this and figure out what to do, for there is going to be trouble for our master and his whole family. He is so ill-tempered that no one can even talk to him. And so when we're going to find out, Abigail doesn't talk to him. Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread. This is is the way you, you need to soften men's heart with Panera, you know? quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins. Eh, okay. Uh, 200 fig cakes. She packed them on donkeys and said to her servants, go on ahead, I will follow you shortly. But she didn't tell her husband, Nabal, what she was doing. Sounds like he was a very unreasonable, hard to reason with, hard to talk to person. As she was riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming toward her. David had just been saying, listen to what he says. This is a big deal. A lot of good it did to help this fellow. We protected his flocks in the wilderness, and nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he has repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. Isn't it great how we spiritualize our emotions? Right? Isn't it great how we do this? This is a man after God's own heart. And this is how he's responding. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed low before him. She fell at his feet and said, and she said some amazing stuff. Listen to this. I accept all blame in this matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. I know Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He is a fool, just as his name suggests. Let's, men, let's all, husbands, let's all live our lives in such a way to where that don't happen. <laughs> let, me, let me treat my wife in such a way where she would never be tempted to say these things about me behind my back, right? He says, but I never even saw the young men you sent. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be as cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles. And you have not done wrong throughout your entire life, which may not be true, but she's pouring it on here. (laughs) Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you. There's a real reference to Saul, right? Your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like, interesting choice of words, like stones shot from a sling. She's done her homework. (laughs) That was a little flashback to the Goliath story. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, reminding him of his future, this is where you're headed, Don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. We could rename this sermon today and just call it the tale of a very wise woman. Be the best way to name this, honestly. You guys are like, hey, man, it's Father's Day. Come back here, all right? (laughs) Listen to David's reply to Abigail. Praise the Lord. 
the God of Israel who has sent you to me today. I mean, this is a moment. This is, this is what separates David from Nabal, the ability to have your eyes and heart opened to what God is doing. He immediately gave praise to God, realized that God sent her to him, gave her this wisdom, and brought it to him. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Then David accepted her present and told her, return home in peace. I have heard what you said. We will not kill your husband. Now, that would be a great place to end the story. And I'm actually not going to read the rest of it. I will tell you, this is so true of so many great stories in the Bible. Uh, in Grove Kids, in Grove Youth, we, we stop the story here. But if you keep reading, she goes home. Her husband, they have a conversation. He knows what's ha- He figures out what happened, what was about to happen to him, and how she stopped it. And he has a stroke. He's paralyzed. And then 10 days later, he dies. And then, yes, David remembered the servant, Abigail, took her to be his wife. Depending on your perspective, you're like, oh, that's pretty awesome, or that's messed up, right? (laughs) It's Old Testament, so it's kind of both, actually. That's what I've learned in life. But here's the thing. When we look at this, I think we're given this amazing, simple thing that teaches us what it means to be. I'm going to just focus on the men first. What does it mean to be a man? How can we become the men God wants us to become? Here it is. A man that God can use is one who admits he's going the wrong way and does something about it. And I think at least the way I was kind of brought up or at least the thing that seemed to be more preeminent in my own life growing up is my biggest temptation, whether I was trained that way. I don't think I was. I don't know if it's my own sin and the culture around me. I don't know what all made it happen, but my natural tendency is that, you know, instead we, we stand firm on what we think is right no matter what, and real men don't back down. <laughs> nope, nope. I'm not backing down. This is what should happen. This is the way I feel about it. This person did this to me, and therefore I'm going to do this. Real men don't back down. They strap up, and they man up, and they go for the fight. I mean, that's kind of the tendency that, that I feel I had in my life growing up. And I sometimes boomerang back to that. But what if real manhood is admitting you're wrong? What if real manhood, for you men who like to drive like I do, like when we go somewhere, I like to drive. I want to be the one that drives. Not only because I get motion sick and must drive, but because I, I like that, that, the control of doing that, I guess. And I don't know why we don't want to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> but we don't, do we? But real men, if you will, <laughs> I kind of hate that phrase, real men do this, real men do that. But if we're going to use that phrase and leverage it for good, I would say today that I think what God is teaching us is that to become the man that he wants us to become, it takes doing what David did, realizing I'm wrong. I'm headed the wrong way. I'm headed towards a terrible outcome. I'm headed towards doing the wrong thing. And I need to stop and turn around right now. And so that's what I'm going to do. Man, that is humility, that is wise, and I think that is what it means to become not just the man, but the woman, the person that God wants us to become. All of us, this is the step that we need to take. What if this was everything? What if this was the key to everything? Just being willing to see yourself and say, I just might be wrong about this. God, am I wrong about this? And if I am, show me, and I will do life your way instead of my way. Uh, I had this experience years ago when my son Cameron was a sophomore in high school. And and the way I've always been driven, man, I just, I think this is a common thing, especially for for dads, is you just want 
your kids to experience the best. And you see their potential, and so therefore you start kind of pushing certain ways, and if we're being honest, we tend to push them in the way that we believe is the right way to be pushed, you know. I was very passionate about be the best student you could be because I tried to be the best student I could be. So I, I emphasize that in my parenting a lot to a fault. And it came to a head when my son was a sophomore in high school. And long story short, I was enacting some consequences that I firmly believed were the right way to go about it. And I'd probably been doing it this way for quite some time. And my wife Sherry was my Abigail. My wife, if you know her at all, she is so sweet. She is so non-confrontational. Unless you don't honor a coupon at Kohl's, that's when things get a little weird. I'm like, oh, okay. That's what it takes to fire up my bride. But almost everything else in life, she is going to not confront at all. But, man, God spoke through her to open my eyes. She said some things to me that helped me to see You're not necessarily wrong to be trying to do that. But what if you're doing that at the expense of the relationship that you could be having with your son? And I wanted to be mad about it. In fact, I was. Didn't like hearing that. Did not like hearing that. But within about 48 hours, I think, (laughs) I'm like, man, she is right. As I really took an honest inventory, most of my conversations with this person that I would die for basically communicated, you must perform, and you can do better. I wasn't seeing it. I was not seeing it. And it was almost like, I kind of feel a little bit like Nabal. I could almost, I was almost like paralyzed with, what have I done? And I'm doing this the wrong way, and I don't even know what to do next. And I I really asked Cher, like, I just need you to help me. I'm going to just start, when I see something happen that I want to respond to in a certain way, I'm going to sidebar with you, say, okay, so our kids did this. I want to be mad and say this. Is that okay? You think that's good? Is that accurate? Or am I being wrong here? And so I really leaned on her and on the Lord to help me reconstruct how I interacted with my son and with my kids. And I will tell you, I'm still messed up, but I do have a relationship with my son, an actual relationship with him. And I wonder what would have happened if God did not send me and Abigail to open my eyes. And I just wonder today if God wants to send you and Abigail. I'm going to give you a list of questions before we pray and sing another song. I want you to consider each of these carefully. And and I know I've been talking about man and manhood, but this is personhood. This is mankind questions here. Let me ask you this first one. Where are you headed right now? Think about that. Like, where is your life headed right now? Where are you going? Where are you going? I mean, the story we just read, one man was going towards me, mine, mine, me. I did this. Another man was like, oh, I'm going to defend my honor. I'm going, to, I'm going to defend the respect I deserve. And we're going to take the battle to that guy. Where were they headed? One man stopped to think about that and listened to wisdom and wanted people to talk to him and, and, and had a humble response to that. One man could not be reasoned with to the point where even the person closest to him, even the people that served him, said, too ill-tempered, won't listen to a thing. So there's the tale of two men right there. But what if you, where you are right now, can ask this question and let God ask it of you and let the people around you, close to you, ask this of you. Where are you headed right now? Secondly, is it the way God wants you to go? And it might be. It might be. One of my little peeves that I formulated years ago is I started noticing a pattern on Mother's Day and Father's Day sermons. It's like Mother's Day comes along. Moms are amazing. Proverbs 31, you're beautiful. You're, you're charming. You're you whatever. Man, come along like, we stink. We need to do better, man. Like, I hate that that becomes the default. So I don't want to assume. 
There could be some, like maybe even the majority, I don't know, in this room that would be like, you know, I, I really do think I'm going in the way that God wants me to go. Awesome. Keep going and give thanks to God for that. Give thanks to God for the people that he sent to you, like God sent Abigail to David, that make that where you're at right now. But if you're there and you're like, man, I, I, there is this area in my life that I know is not where God wants me to go. And I know I'm going in the wrong direction. It's not where God wants me to go. Okay, that's good to know. Third question, if that's true, what are you going to do about it today? And listen, I'm just going to tell you right now, don't overcomplicate that. Stop and go the other way, for one. Whatever it takes to do that. And I'll go back to the first thing we said. If you're like, but I, I don't even know what that looks like. Man, read the Bible. Get in there. So much wisdom, so much instruction to tell you how to do that. Talk to an Abigail in your life. And if you don't have one, then pray for God to send you one. I'm telling you, these are prayers he wants to answer. He wants to reveal to you if you're going the right way or wrong way. He wants to hold that mirror up to you. And he wants to guide you into his path for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 is an amazing promise. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Every one of us in this room, man, woman, boy, girl, husband, father, single man, never had a kid, never married, once married, Whatever, grandpa, young man, whatever you, wherever you are, I'm telling you right now, God made you, he loves you, and he has a plan for your life. And you'll never experience it if you don't stop and say, okay, where am I headed? Is this the way God wants me to go? Oh, no? Then with God's help, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to head in a different direction. I'm going to get all the help I can to do that from his word and from others. Is that the step you need to take today? If so, you're having a David moment like, oh, wow. Okay. I'm so thankful that I've been stopped in my tracks and given this opportunity to turn around. Seize that opportunity right now. Let's ask God to help us do that. Will you bow with me? Oh, Father, as I come before you today, in this room, in this place, there might be someone here who needed their own Abigail moment. They were headed down the wrong direction. Maybe all kinds of examples of that. Maybe it is a parenting issue like what I had, or a marriage issue, or just a life issue a habit that's destroying someone's life or a witness. I don't know what that could be, but Lord, I know that you have the power to allow us to make a U-turn and to guide us into your path for our lives. And I just pray right now, it starts with admitting that we're wrong and admitting that we're going in the wrong direction and being willing to do something about it. And Lord, I pray that whoever in this place, whoever watching or listening online right now has answered those questions realizing, yes, that's me. That's me. I needed this Abigail moment today. If that's them, Lord, I pray right now that they would say what David said. Praise the Lord, oh God, for stopping me. Thank you for stopping me today, God. Now, Lord, as I turn around and run towards you, show me the way. I will read your word. I will pray to you. I will look to the people you've put in my life, the Abigails you've put in my life, and I will seek their wisdom. And I will pursue your will for my life. Oh, Father, I pray and I hope that's happening in this place as a result of your word today. And I celebrate that. In the powerful name of your son, Jesus. 